Lisa Carrington. Hi. Welcome to Between Two Beers. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. We're excited to have you. We're in the Export Beer Garden Studio. It's 10am in the morning, so we're not going to have a beer today. We don't have to. We don't, you didn't have to have a beer for the sake of it. You don't have to have a beer at any time if you don't want to. No. Um, but also, it's probably a little bit of our, our opening sting has been a little yeah. bit flat the last couple of times. So Yeah, I missed the, there's missed no, the snap. I'll just make the sound. <laughs> but anyway, did, did you have a few beers at the uh, Halbergs the other night? Yeah, I had some uh, celebratory um, champagne, which was really nice at the start of the night. So I guess it's we don't get to celebrate that often. So it's really cool to be able to have that moment to be able to do that. Yeah, it must be weird having the Halbergs as such a staple of your annual calendar. <laughs> Sportswoman of the Year 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2021. Supreme Award twice. You must know the scene there as well as anyone. <laughs> like, are some years better than others? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of it's kind of the same, and it comes down to who's on your table. So if ah. you've got some cool people on your table, it can be really um, exciting and fun, and it's all about the chat, because there's a lot of downtime between awards and ad breaks and that type of thing. So Do you get yeah. any say in who's at your table, or is it like a wedding where you arrive and you're like <laughs> scanning the list on arriving, oh, God, <laughs> really, again? Yeah, you can you can put in a request, but uh, it was great this time because it's awesome because often if I'm nominated, my coach is nominated and um, we had one of our younger paddlers nominated as well. So we had a few um, people in our group, which was really great. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever catch wind of like Halberg kick-ons? Like I imagine it's like <laughs> high-performance athletes everywhere. Is it is it like, oh, there's a, there's a fuel bus kicking on to town afterwards or is it always just cut off? No, no, sometimes there is, but I'm yeah. definitely not a part of the, that kind of group. I've got to get home and um, get ready day. for training the next day because it's, it's a weekday. It would be great yeah. if they did it on Saturdays. Yeah, <laughs> if you're listening, Halberg organisers, get it on get it on a Saturday so people can enjoy themselves. Really <laughs> let loose. Yeah, so it was Wednesday night. Are you you're training first thing Thursday morning? Yeah. Order? Seven yeah. seven AM. Yeah. Yeah. Six AM wake up or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Try to just push out the sleep in as long as I can. Kind of uh, work back from when I have to be at the lake. So yeah. It's a it's a kind of early start, getting home at midnight and yeah. <laughs> how big how big kick on sounds like a really good like a really good <laughs> maybe we should try and yeah. introduce or if host anyone's that next got year. info about how big kick on <laughs> yeah. we're, we're interested at least good info coming out of that, that yeah. if you did a recording that night yeah we might actually start with a uh, Halberg story so I was lucky enough to have a chat with your husband yesterday and <laughs> for anyone considering doing a podcast always talk to the partner of the guest because they have some gold and he mentioned uh, a story about the first Halbergs you went together and he kind of framed it as um, Lisa's selective hearing or selective hearing <laughs> in, in our uh, relationship but do you remember the wardrobe malfunction that uh, he was referring to? Yeah I mean I feel he, he gave me a lot of responsibility asking me to take get someone to take his pants up um, and you know I'm pretty sure he said you know take them up two and a half centimeters or whatever it was I told the lady and yeah turns out it was too short <laughs> we got the pants that day and he couldn't really do anything about it I, I did you get inches and centimeters confused yeah, maybe, maybe? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so so his telling of the story was it was kind of you know I think two years into your relationship it was kind of like a big social event and he didn't have a good suit to wear, so he went and bought some new trousers, but they need tailored. And, yeah, he asked for centimetres, you went for inches. <laughs> and so at this Halbergs, he said he was just like low right. His, his, his pants were ridiculously short, and he was sort of low riding around all night, feeling incredibly uncomfortable. Yeah, I think we had to unstitch and kind of iron out that crease. And, yeah, I mean, I guess yeah, it, I guess he's had one suit since then, and he's just worn the same one. Yeah, that's a bit, that's a bit <laughs> Maybe like, new pants. That's a bit like Stephen. You, you were rocking a one-suit situation there for a little while, weren't you? I was, yeah. I've recently upgraded. Um, <laughs> I guess 37 is the age where you get yourself a few new suits. And isn't it funny how fashion's changed? Because now everyone's showing their ankles. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, bef like beforehand, yeah. beforehand. Totally. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm ankle breezing all the time. Yeah, <laughs> might not have played in 2012, but Bucky, <laughs> Bucky used to get away with it. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> um, 
So we actually had a lot of success. So, so the way we do things, we often sort of ask around your circle, friends, colleagues, family, whatever, um, to share some stories. And we had Melody Robinson on a few weeks ago and her circle was tight. It was like a, a cone of silence. No one would give us anything. But your circle's loose. <laughs> you got, we, we got, yeah, we, we had no problem uh, tracking down a few people to give us a few bits and pieces. So we, we kind of wanted to work uh, our way through it. And where are we starting, Shay? Um, Caitlin Regal, oh, yes, um, who's now retired, yes, but um, your partner at uh, at, at Tokyo, mm -hmm. um, like me, it seems like you're a bit of a music enthusiast. So we kind of asked her, well, what 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 does she have when she works out at the gym? What's the what's the <laughs> playlist there? Can you give a description of what your what your gym playlist would sound like? Um, I get uh, mocked a lot, or by coaches and that type of thing. That we have ten songs that we play. Constantly, every time we go to the gym. Okay. So they kind of range around rap, hip hop, R and B, and if you can think of like Kendrick Lamar, Cardi B, uh, and quite a, like some of the songs can be a little bit, you know. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's the kind of stuff we listen to. Does it put? Well, any, I listen to. Does it put? Are you, and are you like? Are you in charge? It used to be in charge of the, <laughs> the, the ops cable, but now I guess it's Bluetooth. Like, are you in charge? Do you walk in and uh, kick that person off? I'm putting my songs on. Is that how it works? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I kind of, you know, like I don't want to be the boss all the time, so I ask the girls or whoever's there. I was like, do you guys want to add a song to the list? They're like, no, no, it's fine. Really? <laughs> do you take requests? Yeah, for sure. Do you? Yeah, because oh. I think, um, you know, if your music, my music's being played all the time, you know, people get sick of it. You want to add new flavour in and, yeah. But then if you if there is a new song in the gym and you're trying to work out, you're like, I'm not, I'm not actually vibing with this. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to skip that and go back yeah. to my favourite. Yeah, typically when we walk into the gym, we listen to see if anyone's around, if, you know, there's a Spotify playlist going on, we're like, no, nah, we're changing. So, yeah. Yeah, nice. <laughs> I, I respect that. I respect that. I rate that. Because mm -hmm. music sets the tone for everything, I, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it is. And I think it, what's awesome is you just kind of, I don't know, I guess with the hip-hop rap, it's, I don't know, it's great music to work out to. You just kind of get into the beat and you, you're in your own world, really. Yeah. yeah. So am I picking as well that you're – you're not playing the radio edit versions in, in the gym? <laughs> no. is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it running through as, yeah. per, as, per, as, the per. Artist, as per the yeah. artist intended? As per, yeah. I like that. I like, the thought of, I like the thought of that. And are you clanging and banging as well when some of those are, are, are you like throwing the, weights, <laughs> throwing the weights down after you've hit a good set? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, it's wicked too. Like I, if you've got someone else that's enjoying it too, and Caitlin and I would have a really good time in the gym when we were going. So, you know, that always that's always fun. Yeah, got to make that enjoyable if you're doing it every day. Um, okay, working through the list, uh, she said, um, only races in red glasses. I'm not sure many people know that. Is this a superstition thing? Um, and is may it, maybe. And is it true? Is that right? Yeah, because, <laughs> yeah, it's just like this one pair. I think, you know, when I first um, won my, when I won my first world championships in 2011, and at that stage, red was like my colour. I really loved it. Um and so I had these red um, Oakleys and they or they had a little bit of red on it, black, and then gradually found that I could get, you know, full red Oakleys and, and I've just stuck with them. That's yeah, awesome. and I just, yeah, I just, it's, those are kind of my racing glasses and I just stick to it. Would you lose it a little bit if you went, on race day and the red glasses weren't there? Like, they broke or... Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd be like, wow, okay, that's... I guess there is a little bit of superstition, but you're like, well, good chance to just see if it's not up to the glasses. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you have mul multiple pairs in your... I don't. I have this one pair. Really? Yeah. And Holy I, shit. Yeah. I, and it's really... Uh, I haven't been able to get my hands on another red pair. Um, oh, man. Yeah. I so it's, it's tricky, I think. Yeah. But I mean, I only wear them when I race. So they stay pretty pristine and I just change the lenses out. Um, the socks out, so yeah. yeah. I, I hope we haven't outed one of your trade secrets to any of your rivals then that try and, <laughs> try and snatch that pair of glasses out of your, out of your gear bag at the, at the next race, race day. Yeah. Um, it's a bit Tiger Woodsy as well, isn't it? Wasn't isn't oh, Tiger yeah. Woods a red hat on the final round? Or red I made, shirt. Red, red shirt. Yeah, nice oh, I have made that up. I've, I've got a habit of making Close. things up. <laughs> hey, man. Close. Okay, this one's a bit of a loaded question, but do you occasionally use your status to claim the master bedroom on, on trips away? <laughs> <laughs> Caitlin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, well, 
yeah, definitely now for sure. Because I'm, um, <laughs> I guess I'm in a group of young girls, so I'm ten. I'm ten years older than the next. Oh, I'm, I'm the next person. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. But I mean, when we were Caitlin, you know, we would paper scissors rock, or you know, week on week off. So. Yeah. Would you actually paper scissors rock, or would you mm. walk in and go, "No, my Spotify playlist and my bedroom. <laughs> no. You're in the you're in the lounge." Yeah, we would rock off. All right. At times, I've heard <laughs> that that age different lends itself to a few nicknames. Do they call you mum? <laughs> do they call you grandma? <laughs> I think sometimes they do like to tease me a bit. You know, if I'm wearing, they call me a bit vintage or. <laughs> <laughs> Your auntie or whatever. Yeah, I, I feel like grandma's really disrespectful. I think I feel like auntie, auntie you could get away with. Calling someone grandma who's our greatest ever Olympian, I feel like that's a bit shit. Yeah, maybe, um, yeah, when I when my time's up, I'll let them call me grandma. <laughs> nice. Well, that paints a little bit of a picture. There's, there's one more story from Bucky that um, I want to go through before we sort of get into the heart of things. And it's around uh, Lisa and her passport issues. <laughs> so he's given me <laughs> this, this story. <laughs> well, how, how many are there? Yeah. Um, but I was wondering if we could get your version and, and I can sort of fill in the gaps from, from what um, he said. There's I, I, two are at the front of my mind. Is good, it, good so far? <laughs> yeah. Um, was this, a dip, there's two. So there's one for, it was like a, we're going away t for a wedding. And one was we were going, I was going to Europe, so Bucky was taking me to the airport. Which one do you want to hear? Well, the first one, I think. The first <laughs> the wedding? One, the, is that the first one? Oh. I think the first one was the Europe trip. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So usually I'm quite, you know, those last moments, so getting on the plane, I'm quite rushed. Um, last minute packing, and I've forgotten a few things. So went into the drawer, grabbed a passport, looked at it quickly. Yeah, that looks like me. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it's a, it's a great start yeah. to a story yeah I think that's mine um, yeah we were getting there and got to the airport you know about to check in looked at it and so Bucky had taken me and uh, it was his passport <laughs> <laughs> in that moment he is a we knew he's a that he's a beautiful <laughs> we he's knew that he had to go back <laughs> so really like half an hour each way you know two hours out of his day but you know i, and got, you're, I got on you're north shore based time. right so did he go yeah. all the way back to the shore yeah what time's the flight oh like i think when you're in a team you get there a bit earlier because yeah. you've got paddles yeah. and things to sort out and like they do li give you a little leeway, right. yeah, for sure. Especially so. if you're checking into that business class. <laughs> business class line, they give you a lot of leeway. <laughs> An hour, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So that was the first one. <clears throat> yeah. And then, was it a year later? There was yeah, another? Yeah, a year later, we were going to Perth for Bucky's cousin's wedding and um, got it was, it was like on a Friday afternoon, so traffic to the airport. There was a lot of roadworks. I don't know if people knew what it Remember that all the roadworks out there... Um, so we got there, I don't know, we were just on time to check in and, um, I ruffled through my bag, uh, no passport <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh. And so it took us about an hour to get to the airport, which would typically would be half an hour. So there was so much traffic and so I had to call a friend to find it and I didn't know where it was. I think it was under my bed in a box and I was like, oh. maybe just have a look, ruffle around. Found it. Did they have a key to get into your house? Yeah, I think we must have put it under the pop lamp or something. Okay. They didn't, they didn't, break, they didn't break in? <laughs> no, okay. thankfully, yeah. So, you know, she, so one friend went in, gave it to another friend who went out to the airport, waiting in traffic, was just sitting there about, I don't know, three Ks from the airport, and I'm waiting, trying to, I don't know, we must have been like 45 minutes from boarding. So, and they were like, it's okay, just wait here, it's fine. So they checked me in, but... I don't know how, but she made it. Th I made it through. Bucky went through. He was waiting, and um, once we got there, obviously very, very flustered. Um, I then get upgraded to business class, <laughs> and he gets to hang out in the back. <laughs> that, that was kind of the punchline of his story. He described this like this tense ride, and, and because of the last passport issue, he was like. You know, I wanted to ask that you have a passport, but I could sense that like tensions were high already, and I just didn't want to stir the pot. Yeah. And then when you acknowledge you had it, and this whole thing, and it was a bit like silence for hours through the trip, and you finally get there, and you're like, "All right, have a nice flight. I'm going to business class." And you go to economy. Yeah, and yeah, I didn't even um, offer it up to him. I was going to, I was going to say that sort of. 
come into come into your mind? Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> and is there is there now a Bucky passport check before you're travelling overseas? There's quite a few. Yeah, right. Yeah, so a few days before, the morning of, as we're driving there in the car when we're at the airport. It's a bit of a generalisation, but I feel like athletes are always kind of last minute pack, packing and travellers. Is that... Uh, just the nature of your lifestyle? Yeah, I think I'd say there's some that are incredibly organised. Right. Um, and then there'll be some that are just not. And yeah, like your, your heart, you're tired all the time, um, training. So you're kind of uh, trying to pack all your gear. You've got to think of, you know, all the things you need to take, wet weather gear, everything. So it's not just like a holiday where you take your togs and your nice clothes. It's kind of packing for everything. So because I'm a, I was am a team manager for large groups, mm. and travel is like the most horrific <laughs> yeah. experience you can have, <laughs> particularly airports. Mm. And like t- teams often have a great way of winding you up by like pretending <laughs> that they've lost passports, <laughs> or and it's like that's just the one place I cannot be messed with. Yeah, because it it is traumatic, and I can imagine if you're on your way to a regatta or something like that, like you're you're like you want everything to be as smooth as possible, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, as I've got older, I think you kind of, I've done it a few times and traveling to Europe or wherever you're going, you just, sometimes you just don't know what you need. Um, and so, yeah, and airports are kind of stressful. You, no one really, so only kind of a couple people know where they're going. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone's just follow the leader. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, there's a lot of stress on those leaders in the team, but it can be. But also like, I guess it's like a good way to, you know, under pressure, just, mm. you know, someone else is taking control of your life in those, that, I don't know, those 24 hours. So, yeah. I imagine you'd be pretty experienced in the airport. So, Halberg Awards in the airport <laughs> for yeah. Lisa Carrington <laughs> is just like two areas that you know. Sweet spot. <laughs> yeah, maybe too relaxed sometimes. <laughs> um, okay, so we also spoke to your coach, the great Gordon Walker, uh, to get his perspective on what makes you so great. And there's a bit to cover here and and we're going to sort of dive in. So I asked him to explain why you were so good. He said there were a few things like extraordinary speed and power, but the word he circled back to was consistency. He said, you'd been a world champ every year last decade. You'd never not been on a podium and the results are through constant and persistent mundane work. So I kind of wanted to start, like, where does that come from? Where does that discipline come from? Uh, I guess it's something that I've learned that I've needed to, uh, or I guess I've learned because that it, that's what it takes. Um, and I guess it's whether it's the need to be, you know, as good as I can so I'm not bad. Um, so that whether it's, I don't know, I'm afraid of failing so I just try work so hard and I think I've also just worked out uh, from a young age just that it takes small steps um, I don't know that when I was 19 I think or 18 I moved to Auckland and um, came here to train near and close to the high performance team and so I don't know that I would have ever been able to do what I do now at 19 so for me I just had to figure out okay what are my steps what is this something that I can just do um, a little bit better. And I think just having good role models, also Gordy's just got a wealth of understanding and knowledge of what it takes um, to be good um, physiologically and mentally. So, uh, and just always looking for where I can do it better. Um, and once you get a foothold, I think what's great is that you get momentum. So we, you're kind of climbing up the mountain step by step. And you're like, oh, this is not too bad. And then it kind of builds a bit of momentum, create a few habits, and um, I guess set your path. I love it when we have someone who is the absolute best in the world at what they do and to sort of unpack, you know, their, their childhood or their upbringing to determine, I've got young kids, mm. I don't necessarily want them to be Olympic gold medalists, <laughs> but I'd love for them to have sort of discipline in their lives. When you think back to growing up, both your parents were teachers, is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you, um, are there anything that stands out to you about, like, are your siblings all built the same way? Like, do you all have the same skill set? And is there anything that you can think back to that helped form you this way? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm, def- I'm sure that physiologically, like, my, um, we're all really sporty. Um, and my parents were sprinters, you know, they were athletic sprinters. So um, 100, 200, whatever it was, and netball, rugby, uh, you know, typical Kiwi family. Um, 
so yeah there's definitely some genetics that play into what I do and I guess what I yeah and also being exposed to sport at such a young age um loving it and enjoying it and that's part of our household you develop so many skills I think you know with we're socially working with people and something I don't, that my mum you know taught me you got to learn how to be a good winner and a good loser so playing netball at five years old and losing you know that's it's okay you know turn up next Saturday and play again so I think it's really great to and to do it as a team so I didn't really get into individual sports or anything until I was um, about 13 or 14 into surf life saving mm. so yeah because you're the youngest of three right Yes, yeah. So I followed my two older brothers, and yeah, they had. I, I, I don't know. Everyone has this, but you want to be cool like them, you know. They were. I admired them. I wanted to be like them. So my oldest brother was really good at the surf ski, um, and so I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be good at that too. And my middle brother is really good at surfing, so I was like, I'm gonna do that too. So I think for me, you know. It's funny, I was watching this video the other day and it's kind of saying, you know, um, something's co- something's only cool once your older brother tells you it's cool. You're like, okay. Yeah. So uh, for me, it was a lot like that. I did what they did because it was cool. Um, and I wanted to be like them. Did you watch your parents playing sport as well growing up? Uh, my mum played netball when I was young. Yeah. Uh, when we were growing, when I was in primary school and that type of thing. And she would, um, she managed and coached my high school teams and that type of thing. But... No, I think my dad had stopped. He was kind of in that era where, you know, you he had needed glasses and he couldn't see at night time. So he couldn't play rugby. So from the age of early 20s, he had to stop. Wow. Yeah. Did, did you dominate school athletics days? <laughs> Sprint champ, cross country, long jump, <laughs> shot put, these sort of things? Yeah, it was, I'm a, I am from a really small town. So there's not many of us competing at these athletics days. So yeah, I would, I'd do all right. Cross country, I was okay. It wasn't, especially at high school, I hated it. Um, but yeah, like I think looking back when I was um, 16, you know, I won the, the senior shot put. Yeah. <laughs> not like I had an upper body then, but like, yeah. So, and also the sprints, 100 meter sprints and that type of thing. So, yeah. For regular listeners, um, you're going to be sick of me talking about this, but we had a guest, Tim <laughs> Wigmore, on a couple of years ago, and he wrote a book about how to create sort of elite athletes. <laughs> and two of the main themes of it were being a younger sibling, having older mm. brothers and sisters, and being from a small town because you get more <laughs> opportunities and there's just yeah, more access. It's easier to get to places and you just end up playing more sport. Do you credit like your small town um, upbringing to, to success? I, it's almost like I would say that you have more opportunity if you lived in a big city. Um, you've got the opportunity for me, I guess, I didn't have a lot of sports to choose from, um, you know, and kayaking wasn't even a sport in Fakhtani. It was just something that um, my dad, you know, as good parents do, they he'd watch the Olympics from a young age, so he knew kayaking was at the Olympics. So I was good at the surf ski from surf club, so he's like, well, that should be really good for you. Um, and then, you know, me and one of my best friends, you know, we were the only two people kayaking in Fakhtani. So I think it's, I guess it comes down to, I don't know, like having, not having everything, but enjoying it. Um, also, I guess, you know, there's, you're not you're not fighting through the masses to make the A-teams, yeah. <laughs> those types of things. Um, yeah. Did, am I right in thinking that you, while you were kayaking, in Fakatana, you, you didn't have any formal coaching or anything as well, right? You just kayaked? Uh, or was that a, am I doing you a disservice or your coach a disservice? <laughs> yeah, so I guess I, I, how it worked was I did surf life saving. We had um, surf life saving, you know, coaching, I don't know, through the summer it was every afternoon at 3.30 at the beach and in the winter it was kind of a couple of days a week. So that was, we have kneeboard or surf ski. Um, you'd also sometimes go to the pool, um, do some pool sessions, uh, swimming. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the coaching, but the, yeah, we did kind of do our, I did paddle kind of on my own. I had a, a program from a coach here in Auckland, um, who was taking us to the junior worlds when I was, uh, 17 last year at high school. So, um, yeah, they, there were people helping, but I didn't really know you had, I had coaches at surf life saving and that type of thing, but it's definitely not the structure that I know right now. <laughs> On your siblings, um, 
I was, I was trolling your, your inst- not trolling, I was scrolling <laughs> Yeah, and so I wasn't writing comments about... <laughs> yeah, you, you stopped that a little <laughs> while ago. You stopped, you stopped trolling people a little while ago, thankfully. But I did see, is your brother a personal trainer? Yes. Like he seems to have that same discipline, right? He, he's obviously got a fantastic physique and, you yeah. know, is are you guys very similar? Uh, yeah, like, I, you know, he's passionate about fitness and... Um, being healthy and that type of thing. So, yeah, like versions of 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 health and wellness and body and I guess strength and that type of thing. So, I mean, that's really great to be able to connect with someone like him. You know, we'll talk about gym numbers and that type of thing. So like playlists, <laughs> yeah, playlists. Probably, I think actually, I think my my music taste comes from my older brother. Like I remember what yeah. listening to like Eminem and. Or the Dr. Dre and all that when I was probably too young. Um, Chronic, Chronic, 2001, The Chronic, <laughs> yeah. that was the album yeah, to was my the album. childhood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, it starts from a young age, that influence. Isn't it, isn't it cool <laughs> though, how music, just to jump back on music, how it takes you back into a moment of time? Yeah. Like when you were there and you're like, man, I, I'm right back to where I was when I first heard that, like, that song or that cassette tape for me. Yeah. And I, I think it's just cool. I, it's amazing. I do think I it credit my older brother for kind of, like my taste right now and I yeah. mean it's just the influence right yeah. and to be influenced by you know your siblings is cool I, that I can that hits so hard with me as well because mm. it's the same like if my brother Richard said something was cool I was like <laughs> yeah no that is cool and even now yeah. to this day people are like why do you like that like because my brother did and <laughs> obviously I do yeah um yeah it isn't it's a really interesting point just mm. a little nerd fact to me are you mm. Fakatani High School or Trident Fakatani High School okay I just wanted to just Clear, clear that up. <laughs> She's a really weird details guy, yeah. and stuff like that is important. Yeah. I, just want to I don't clear, know why. Clear that up for any Eastern Bay Plenty <laughs> listeners that might yeah, be out there. But I, right. I've got a couple of people yeah. that I know that grew up in Fakatane as well, ah. and they were split between the two high schools. So I just wanted to, yeah, just wanted to understand. Yeah, that. no, it changes. I think it's in popularity, kind of as you know, decades as you haven't been there. It's like, which ones the more weird kids going these days? Yeah, and, yeah. Was it, is there a big rivalry between those two? Uh when I was at school, a little bit. Um, I think. Although the schools would have different strengths, I think. So n- not always a massive rivalry. Right. Yeah. Cool. Going go for some real niche fucking time. <laughs> <there. Yeah. laughs> That'll appeal to a few. <laughs> um, all right, move us along. Uh, so like I said, we also talked to Bucky. And um, he gave us these bits, but he also gave an incredibly articulate answer <laughs> to what makes you the best in the world. And I'm actually going to just read out what he said. I'm not sure if he practiced this, but it was really good. <laughs> he said, kayaking is her gift. She uses kayaking as a vehicle to be a better person. Working on herself every day to be better than she was yesterday. Leaves no stone unturned, more committed than anyone I've ever come across. Never missed a training session in 13 years we've been together. Surrounds herself with really good people. She never does more than what's required. If a training session says, this is how long you're going to paddle for, that's what she does. It's helped her not burn out and be injury free. She also has an awesome relationship with Gordy and she's journey focused. The everyday aspect of kayaking is more important than the end result. Again, what, a, what, <laughs> an, answer, what an answer. Um, but does that, does that sound right to you? What, what parts of that hit hard? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, there's, you know, people in your life that are always going to see, um, you know, the good things. Um, and, you know, he is one of those. But, um, yeah, I, I think it's kind of around um, the journey thing. Yeah, it's for me, I guess it's important about the moment, enjoying the moment, you know, not looking forward to something being over. And that's probably something that I constantly have to bring myself back to. Um, in particular, this morning I had, um, it was an endurance paddle, so it was two hours paddling on the water. Um, and so I was, Started, I was like, man, I'm so tired. It's been a big week. I've got the stupid podcast I'm going to do after, <laughs> after, yeah. after this God. as well. <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know, I guess it's like that self-talk. It's like, okay, not look forward to the weekend, but kind of enjoy the moment. And as I've got older, I've realised that, you know, what I get to do, I'm not going to be able to do it forever. So every moment is, I guess I have to have to feel grateful for it you know tomorrow or next year I may not be able to be paddling um, and it will suddenly be gone and the next part of my life will, will have started so yeah like for me it is it's also yeah it's about the journey um, 
and nothing it kind of helps that things don't have to be perfect in the moment it's kind of we're heading in that direction um that's where I'm going but think about it right now the the part about never missing a training session in Mm. 13 years is that right yeah yeah like I I don't know I just I think once you get on a roll you know like I'm never missing if Mm. I'm a little bit sick I'll you take pride in it yeah and I'll adjust it but I I kind of believe that for me I I, you don't have to miss training if I think you said as um, Bucky wrote there like I'll do exactly what is written because if I do more I can't turn up the next day or the day after that. That's so such it's a happy. good lesson. So, you know, sometimes you're like, man, I feel really good today. I'm just going to do an extra rep or extra set. Or, um, but really, the training program in Gordy's, this is why he's so good. It's if you do everything that's written, it's for a bigger purpose. So it's not for that moment. It's for, you know, six months down the road, a year down the road. So just, and I guess that's why I'm fairly, con- you know, consistent. Because I just, you know, do exactly what's required and I, it's a habit, not habit, but it's like a ingrained thing that I have. I'm like, I'm not doing more. I don't want to do more than I have to. I'm definitely not one of those people that will go out and go for an extra jog after training or anything like that. <laughs> Is there an example, people get sick. You, you're not yeah. superhuman, you get sick. Um, across these 13 years, there must have been a time when you were really like, oh, I don't know if I can do it. Mm. Like, but to pull yourself up and go to a training session yeah. when every part of your body is saying you can't do it. Like, are there, yeah. there been times like that? Yeah, for sure. And it's kind of, I guess it's working out in your mind. It's like, okay, what is that? What is real? Okay, so am I just tired and I'm just grumpy? Um, or am I, what can I do rather than what I can't do? So, and what's the most important thing? Is it recovering? But, you know, I, I guess I've learned that you can still exercise if you're feeling a little bit under the weather. The priority really comes down to the recovery. So, you know, you can, st- I, for me, I just know if I'm a little bit under the weather, I'll train at my minimum. I won't train as hard as I can. I won't put those high expectations on myself. Um, and then I know that my body's probably not going to recover as quickly because I'm a bit under the weather. So I will rest hard. I will eat really well you know, all that orange juice, that immunity juice, whatever. I don't even know if it works, but <laughs> I'll try it. And just recovery, sleep, rest, and kind of, you know, settling your mind and going, you know what, I need this. Just, you know, turning on Netflix and just chilling out. Because yeah. yeah. there's no more salient example, because I got it right in thinking you've been pretty much injury-free your entire career. Have you had any majors? Um, touch wood, but Sorry, no. Yeah, don't want don't, don't <laughs> to jinx anything. Yeah, I guess that kind of no injuries as such for sure and I've got a really good team that kind of helped me understand my body um I'm also really um I'm really I guess I don't like being injured I don't like being hurt I really struggle to push myself so hard that my body can't recover so in a way that plays um that's an advantage that I have but also a disadvantage because it means that I have to I'm not always going to turn up and be able to put in a hundred percent every day I have to really bring my you know, mental everything to do that. But it sounds like a session is better than no session, right? Absolutely. And just turning up, I think that was one of my main things when I, you know, first figured out how to be a high performance athlete or just to be an athlete was just turn up and then, you know, try find the joy in turning up, turn up because your mates are there or because you actually, I actually love paddling, um, not turn up because I have to be there. It's It's kind of changing that from, I know probably not too much expectation to then um, doing it because it's my choice. Yeah, if, if there's one thing we've learned along this podcasting journey, it's consistency and quality over time. Mm. It just compounds. And yeah. and Gordon said, yes, you are genetically blessed. Like you you do have have these these traits that other people don't have. But it probably took five to ten years of training to activate them, and that's. You know, going mm. to the gym every day, it's not missing workouts. It's mm. its the consistency of what you do over time and it just sort of snowballs. Absolutely. And it's, you know, you're not going to, um, you know, climb Mount Everest in your first go. So I think just knowing that you can't achieve, you can't be where you want to be tomorrow. Um, and that just know that it will, will take time. But you just, I guess it's also, you just got to be on it all the time. Small bits all the time. 
And I think that's probably what's really tricky is that maybe at times we have so much concentration for a short period of time and we want to be there tomorrow, but it's like, well, it's actually, it's a little bit over a long time, which is the hard part. People lose interest. Yeah. It's get distracted. <laughs> Man, this is so cool. Like, people know this. People mm. know this is how you do, but not many people have the discipline to, to do it. And every day turn up, keep turning up, whether you're sick, whether you're injured, yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, and it's just, but it's also knowing what's, you know, if you're sick or injured, like, just make good decisions. <laughs> you know, don't go out and go out on the weekend and party or, you know, fill your day with meetings or, I don't know, all the extra things that you can fill your life with. Um, just prioritize. That's tricky. I think that's, what's, that's what it's about, being an athlete, is prioritizing. So know that, you know, you're going to be tired most of the time um, and, you know, those social events or some things you have to kind of put on the back burner, which it can be tricky. It's fascinating, like, with younger athletes mm. that are coming through that are kind of towards that elite end, if they get an injury, I, I, I used to shake my head all the time, of like, what's the physio told you to do? Oh, they've told me to do this, this, and this. Oh, are you doing it? Nah. Mm. Like, well, fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you ain't going to get any better. You're not going to, like, get recover from your injury any faster. Like, the people that are advising you these things have, like, spent time to mm. hone their skills. What makes you think that you can't listen to their advice? That you, like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, listening absolutely. to you saying about Gordon putting a program together, he's put it together for a purpose. Mm. So that's what I'm going to stick to. Is your sample size Melville United youth players <laughs> <laughs> and senior players <laughs> and, and, and senior and senior players? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I guess it's it is, but I think too, it's um, it's up to it's something we have to learn as an athlete that you know these people are there to help. Us, they're not going to be the ones that you know have will cross that finish line or get on that um, their field or on the water um, race down the track. And I guess you also need to I guess you don't want to put all your weight in one person's opinion. It's like okay, um, just say with the physio, it's like you can't train. Well, it's like well, let's look at the issue. Like what what is it that I can't do? And I guess it's having those really mature conversations and going, actually, there's some things I can, what's good, what's not good. Figuring out, you know, there's, you know, there's always a way, you can always do something. It's always, you know, if you can't train, it's like, well, I don't know if that's right. You know, I guess this is my point of view. You know, some people just can't. But I think there's always, you know, there is a way to get around, not get around it, but work it out. Is it, are, you, are you a curious person by nature? Like if you get told something, are you like, well... Well, I don't like being told what to do. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> if you get advised something, are you, are yeah, you for sure. I'll be asking like, good yeah, questions? Yeah, and because for me, so as you know, I haven't missed a lot of training, but I'd be like, well, okay, if you're telling me I can't do something, um, what is it that's impacting me? And I guess, it's help, I guess that's really important to understand what it is. And then you're like, okay, I believe what you're saying. I will. Um, it's my choice to stop. It's not being told what to do, but taking, I guess it's taking that responsibility to understand. And also, I guess, um, you've got to build relationships over a period of time. And that sometimes it takes a bit of time to find that trust for someone to, you know, advise you. Um, like, you know, the likes of Gordy and my physio, when they advise me, I'm like, okay, cause we've built really good relationships and they, you know, it's about understanding. They need to understand the athlete as well. It's not just a blanket question, you know, this is what you need to do. This is quite a nice seg into the next part I want to talk about, which is the mental space of race day. And I wondered mm -hmm. if we could sort of hone in on a specific example to sort of, I don't know, hopefully pull out some gold. So Tokyo 2021, you win two gold medals on the same day. Two days later, you've got the K1 500, which is your hardest race. And if you win gold, you become New Zealand's most successful Olympian of all time. Can you walk us through like the hours before that race? Like, is it is there anxiety? Is there pressure? How are you dealing with it? And and walk us through to sort of when it actually starts. Yeah, and I, it's funny because I think I had purpose. You know, media or yeah, media <laughs> had kind of mentioned to me, or oh, you know, if you if you go to this Olympics and you win this, you know, you're gonna be. Um, you know, the most decorated Olympian or whatever, you're going to overtake Ian Ferguson or, and I don't know, like, I guess to me that wasn't helpful. Um, you know, whether I was or wasn't, you know, that's a, that's looking at a potential and 
I guess for me, I didn't need that kind of pressure. Um, but I guess what was really tricky about that week is really it's the whole week. Um, and that week, you know, that's those six days of racing um, was scary. And it's something that I had to, you know, prepare myself for uh, four years or five years um, prior to that moment. And just knowing how difficult the program was, um, knowing exactly, um, you know, the heats, the quarterfinals, the semifinals, um, how I needed, what type of energy I needed to put into each race because I wasn't going to be able to do every race at 100%. That's just not possible. And so I think, you know, it's, it's a package. The week was a package. It wasn't just about one moment. Everything had to line up. And I had to trust the plan. So the plan, like I said, it was, okay, um, you know, if it starts on Monday. Um, was it Tuesday? I can't even remember which <laughs> day we started racing. Um, and so, you know, that, that first race, the heat, um, I just had to make sure that you know, I, I made it through to the next round. And so, you know, there's going to be some parts of that race that were going to be really important to execute and also leaving some training up to that week, up to those first few days of racing. So knowing that um, those races, uh, when I'm at the Olympics, that I'm still learning, I'm still building towards um, really my biggest race, which was the K1 500, which was four days down the track. So for me, it was... That's scary, looking at that whole week. And I guess talking to my, my psych, we were kind of talking through it. And I guess it's really important for me to be really honest with myself. And, and I guess you can get away with, you know, pretending everything's fine and brushing over. It's like, I'm not scared and I don't feel pressure. You know, I'm really good under pressure. But, I mean, no one is, uh, I mean, people can be good under pressure, but you're going to feel it. So for me, it was like, okay, what about thing about being grateful and man what an opportunity and I guess one thing was it's like well don't you know like when little kids they get to go to the playground it's like they love it you know when their parents get to say okay let's go to the playground it's fun so for me it was like yeah actually when I get to go out there and race it's like going to the playground so when you know mum and get, dad get to take you get to go on the swing again get go down the slide they get to push you so for me, it turned into this thing of being, wow, this massive week to, oh my gosh, I get 12 opportunities to go out on the playground this week. Cool, I'm excited. And also just knowing that, you know, some events or some athletes will have one opportunity to go out there. Some athletes will have one race, so, and they may not even make it out of the first round. And then they're done. Olympics, over. All that, those years, done. And even the likes of, you know, like a triathlon or they has got one race, one chance. Whereas I get 12 times, I get to go out on that race course um, and practice, enjoy it, get out there on the playground. So for me, it was kind of taking that mentality to, to enjoy it, find, you know, gratitude, uh, make, you know, making myself go, wow, this could be the last time I'm ever here. And making the most of it and I guess for me it really helped allowed me to be really present and be able to execute what I needed to so it wasn't I guess what what I find pressure does is it takes me away from my plan it takes me away from enjoying it I don't really get the most out of my body so the way that to be in the moment to commit to not be afraid to put all my effort in was you know what I'm just going to give it a go this is fun. I'm grateful to be here. So I guess that that's a long way around your question. No, that's a, that is one of the most that is one of the most gripping parts of any episode that we've ever had in 150 whatever it is. That was amazing. Yeah, Stevie's welling up. I can see it. Yeah. So I mean, I just guess what's so awesome is I've got these wicked people that you know that know how to help me be there. They're not going to go. Oh, Lisa, you know it's so hard for you. You need, you've got so many races. Gosh, that's hard. I was like, well, that's not helpful. What's helpful is help me be there. Help me give everything I've got and what it takes because it is tough, but help me enjoy it because that is 
it's probably the hardest part is to be in the moment when you're scared shitless. You're like, I could, you know, like you said, um, I could have easily not been um, the most decorated New Zealand Olympian. I could have come last or I could have fallen in or, but it's like, well, you know what? I guess it's being on the line, accepting both, accepting, you know, what could happen and both things, uh, bad and good, and going, you know what? I'm just happy to be here, but I'm just going to try my best. It worked perfectly, this going to the playground and, and enjoying each one. On that last race, was it, were you still there? And was it still enjoying going to the playground or was it, was it more intense, that last one, than the others? Yeah, so I guess what was really tricky is, um, was the last two rates, so two days were um, the K4. So I, so the first four, you know, the first two days were all about the uh, K1 200 and the K2 500 with Caitlin. Um, so we, you know, and that's when I won two gold medals um, in the one day. And then the following two days were K1 500, just that one event. And then the last two were the K4. So absolutely, it got really, really tough by the end to feel, especially being in a team, to feel that I was good enough, that I had every, you know, all the energy I needed. But I think what was amazing about my team is that they knew what I'd been through. And it, for them too, it was about a package. So the package was, uh, they were a part of my K1 K2 victories or whatever and they were supporting in that way and then the K4 you know it was about the whole thing but definitely it was really really challenging by the end to stay there mentally and it is the self-doubt it's like man I hope because I mean when you're in a team you don't really know what your contribution is because you're with others and that type of thing so I was just hoping that I was just doing the best I could so that doubt yeah because I don't want to let them down. For people listening to this, they'll be thinking, this is our greatest ever Olympian and she has self-doubt. Like, how does she have self-doubt? But everyone does, yeah, right? And, absolutely. and that's what Gordy said about what he comes in as a coach is that there are th- when there are times you are doubting yourself, he helps you believe in yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And just, I guess it's not about, you know, I find it not that helpful when people go, nah, Lisa, you're, you're really good. You're going to be fine. That to me, it's like, that's... I, I need to believe in me. I don't need you to believe in me, but I need to find a way that I know I'm good enough. And in a way, it's, it's, it is that. So it's not necessarily like yeah, my performances, I've done the training, that's all lined up. And it does come down to own personal belief. It's like, man, do I, am I still accepting of myself even if I'm shit? And that's really what it is. It's being so scared to not be shit, you know? And so... I think it's it's about accepting that all facets of who you are to then be able to like unleash you know unhitch that trailer and go you know what I don't care you guys can you can judge me or I can judge myself but I'm just going to do all I can and I'm okay with it. On the start line two minutes before the race starts what's going through your head? Yeah so I think it's really uh, if I go back to the K1 200 day with, and that was the same day that I had to also erase, um, I don't know, like 90 minutes later with Caitlin in the K2 500. Um, I guess I, I'm fairly confident in the K1 200. So I guess for me, it was like, man, this event, it's the, cause it's also the last time it was at the Olympics, which is a real shame. Um, and so for me, it's okay. It was really difficult to not, look my you know to not look beyond that race but I think for me it was like okay this is this is my race I enjoy this and so you know I had finishing that and I mean then I had to I, I can't even remember all the details to be honest <laughs> is, is that the case? does it you do you go into a blur does it all just kind of oh absolutely you go into autopilot? yeah and the conditions were really tricky so it was really choppy so I don't really know that my 200 that day was the best one I could have ever done. Um, but it was the best one on that day. It was, a, yeah, exactly. And it's a package. I then had to go back out on the course and race with Caitlin in the K2 500. And I think, you know, that was, that's an event we'd been training and 
things had been going pretty well in training. We're like, wow, okay, we're kind of fast. Like, but is that just because we've got a really nice tailwind and yeah, yeah. the courses that we're training on is really just good? Little doubt <laughs> creeping in, just creeping in. Yeah, yeah, keep you on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess for me, you know, I was I was also a bit concerned at that moment. I'm like, man, Kate, I'm I'm just worried that I I've done this other event and I'm worried that I'm not going to be good enough and. To me, she just goes, Lisa, whatever you have, I'm all good with because that's enough for me. So for me, you know, that just helped me go, oh, sweet. I'll just be myself. Just her giving me the permission to just be whoever I was at the moment really helped me kind of unleash and probably in a way I could perform better because I had no doubt. With everything we've just spoken about, when you win that gold to become the most decorated uh, Olympian, Mm straight after the race is it an outpouring of emotion does it all come out of you to be honest i didn't even that's not even the first thing that came to my head i didn't even like that's not even why i do it so not until you know i was on the um you know you go through this media i don't know media scrum or whatever they call it (laughs) (laughs) um and you know new zealand reporters are there and they're like oh so how do you feel about this and i was like oh well, nice. actually, <laughs> the most important thing for me was actually just winning the K1500. So the K1500 is this event that, you know, I've been, I guess it's the scariest race for me. It requires absolute fitness. It hurts a lot. I've got to go off from my first stroke. I have to be as, as, I have to go as fast as I can. And that's scary to know that I've still got to, you know, like a minute I don't know, minute 45 to a minute 50. Um, and what if I die before the end? Um, so for me, this event really extracts or demands of me to be fearless. And, you know, I do have a lot of fear. I'm quite risk adverse. So it really helps bring out the best in me. And so for me to be able to do that race and to win um, – and just be there, man. The Olympics is massive. To be able to do that in that moment was more important than having an accolade of most whatever it is. <laughs> you, you speak to how the Olympics is massive, and it is massive, mm. and regular listeners of the podcast. Oh, will God, here comes Shay's we'll Olympic stories. Me talking about the time I went to the Olympics in 2012 with the New Zealand football team when you won yeah. your first gold. Yeah. Um, so you've got this internal situation going mm. on there's a billion distractions in the athletes village do you lock yourself away from those things and just kind of go and eat and come back and or are you into like what's your outside of competition olympic experience like yeah so i guess what we've kind of learned um over the years is that you know the the village is quite distracting so we managed to not stay in the village um and it's not something that you know the new zealand team uh, want you to do they want you to be in the team but I think for us, it, it really helps that. It helps the distract, there to be no distraction because, you know, athletes are finishing, mm-hmm. starting, lots of nerves and that type of thing. But also there was COVID going around. Yeah. So the risk was really high. And I think, you know, if, if one of us, so if I got COVID or got, you know, distracted or anything, it impacts my whole team. That means we can't race the K4, it really changes a lot. So I think it's all about what is looking at, okay, what is best case scenario and how close can we get to it? And that's kind of what we stick to. High performance chat. We've had um, Eric Murray and Emma Twig on the show and we've spoken about Dick Tonks and his methods and and how he was an incredibly hard coach. I wonder how he feels about being talked about, you know? But but we (laughs) praise him. Hopefully we find out one day. But we we praise him for being like the most successful as well. Like Mm. his methods got results, but they were difficult at times and perhaps in some views uh, bordering on bullying. Your coach is obviously very different, Gordy. Um, But I wondered how would you respond to hard coaching do you think there's a place for that and do you think there's a really clearly defined line between um, bullying and being too hard on athletes and just pushing them really hard yeah um i think it's yeah i mean there's i guess with um i see that bullying is probably something when someone is trying to be bigger than someone else right 
So if that's the case, then yeah, that's bullying. But if someone's trying to help you be better, I guess then maybe their methods at times and uh, kind of people don't quite like them. But I think, um, I guess if you can tell or understand where that person comes from, what, you know, that they're there to make you better, to help you perform. It's not about themselves being, you know, especially as a coach, I think, can be, you know, you do take back seat. You are in charge of a lot of people. And um, so, yeah, I definitely empathise with, you know, how challenging it is as a coach sometimes. So I think that everyone will respond differently to different types of training. And I guess... What I, you know, like to, how I like to be coached is, you know, to learn, to know, to be curious about um, what I'm doing. How is it changing me? How is it my body um, adapting? Or I guess the more I know, then the more I will choose to follow. So, yeah, I'm lucky because Gordy will explain. Yeah, I've, I've heard... Uh, you describe both of you as quite stubborn people. <laughs> and I wondered, are there times when you've clashed and is it because he's asking you or telling you to do something you don't want to do? Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah, absolutely. Or um, if I, yeah, if I'm trying to convince myself to do what he thinks is best, but I can't seem to get or oh, we'll figure out why I don't want to do it. And often it'll just be because I'm pestering him and be like, like why? Like, you know, little kid in the back, are we yeah. there yet? Yeah. Why? Why? <laughs> you know, so I think it's, um, yeah, we are absolutely stubborn, but I think it's like having the, you know, it's having the maturity to be able to sit down and go, look, I actually just want to help me. I may have, you know, may have come across this way, but I just actually just want to know, or I'm actually just working it out. I'm figuring out myself who I am. Um, and, you know, sometimes you spray it on the most important people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Coming up to 16 years of, of being in a high-performance environment, when you – oh, my, my mouse might be wrong on that. But when you come to the end of a cycle and you've won a gold medal at the Olympics, when you start again, do you start with a fresh table or do you go, these six things worked really well. In order for us to get better, let's just work on this one thing. Like, how, What does that process look like? Yeah, I mean, um, it's all about building on what you learned all the last kind of cycle. And I think it, nothing, I guess you can kind of, as you go, you can go, well, did that work? Or was that as effective as you think? And But it is, I guess it's it's just constant building. So you're adding. Um, and I guess there's always things that you constantly relearn, I find. That if I learned something when I was 21 and I well. I guess I relied on thinking I knew it and then I almost relearn it again, but it may be in a deeper way. So I guess that's also something we try to do is understand concepts deeply, not understand more things, uh, you know, a lot more things, but little, knowing a little about them. Mm. So whether it's technique, it's physiology, recovery, mental skills, it's not about kind of picking at the next new fad that's come out yeah. and going, that's the thing that's going to make me better. It's like, well, Let's just go deeper on what we already know. That's what I was kind of driving at is that like, okay, the whole world is real basic example. Mm. The whole world's doing cold showers now. Okay, yeah. we're going to do cold showers mm. or we're going to introduce yoga mm. because of this, this, Don't ever go at cold I'm showers, man. I'm not having <laughs> a go. If you're going to have go <laughs> cold showers, we're going to have problems. I'm not going to have a go at cold showers, but I'm just, you know. The sort fads, of, for sure. Yeah, it is a fad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think the, the northern you, hemisphere people have been doing it for a long time. Do you, do you cold shower? Is it part of your repertoire? Yeah, like that's something I um I do, and I don't know. Like I guess it's why. Why do you do it? It's not because it. I, it sucks. That's, that's why you do it because it sucks. It's a way to start the day with yeah. something that sucks that you don't want to do. That's my yeah, kind of take. So on I it. think like I guess that's the thing with fads is people do them because they're like cool for the moment, but people stick with things when they really know what they mean. Like, so, winning, like winning gold medals consistently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and, you know, I'll have a go, yeah, like I'll have cold showers or ice bars and that type of thing. And, you know, there's a lot of um, research on how they improve your recovery or that type of thing. But also, like, they have such great way to bring you um, your breathing, you know. And I think 
<laughs> get posture. <laughs> um, so you just got to know it is, you know, there's a million things that I'm sure I could do better or I could be doing to make me better, but you can't do all of them. So well, just pick a few. <laughs> and one of the really interesting ones that seems to have stuck with you is journaling. Yeah. Are you a daily journaler? Yeah. Do you find that you just want to write the same thing over and over again? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but, but do yeah. you? Um, yeah, like sometimes I'll start, I think there's different types of journaling and I guess that's something, you know, more recently I just talking to my psych, I'm like, well, I do this thing every day. Like what, is it just become a behavior that I'm not really thinking about and I'm just doing because that's what I've always done. And so, you know, there's lots of different types and I think it's, it's about, you know, there's times I guess you can be free journaling. So just write whatever you feel and that can be really cathartic and helpful. And then also, you know, in the morning I journal, I'll have a coffee and I'll sit there and, you know, assess my sleep. It'll be like, how'd it go? Just help me clear my thoughts, find, um, what, find my focus because usually, you know, I'm training at seven. So I need to be focused for that moment that I'm getting on the water. What's my day going to be? Um, so it just helps me bring into that moment um, to not get distracted by, I don't know, you can get distracted by the news. You look at the news and what's happening and around the world and thinking about that. But Don't go on TikTok, Lisa. <laughs> no. Don't go on TikTok. <laughs> yeah, so is, it's just staying focused. Is it like uh, training? You don't miss a day with journaling? And how many years have you done it for? No, I definitely do. Like on a Sunday, maybe I've slept in and uh, you know, there will be times I don't do it. But what I do notice is that it is it is doing it for over and over. It's really important for me. Um, and just being focused because what I've, I guess as you get older, you kind of realize the things, get more aware of the things that distract you. So when I'm, or what it takes to be, on form and I know that I get on the water um, I just say I have a, uh, an important session in the morning and I notice that I'm really distracted my sometimes my sessions go all right and sometimes they don't so I guess in those moments it's like some days I need more help to be able to be on form do what I want to do and I guess if you look at it for for me we only get you know I, you can only train for so many hours a day you can't go out there and just you know, be paddling or in the gym for 10 hours a day, just not humanly possible. So making the most of the moments that we have, really we're only training maybe two and a half to three hours a day. Um, it's not much, but obviously the energy required is a lot. Um, so you just have to make the most of it because you, you don't get another shot. That, that hour is gone. The, the last thing I want to do is bore our audience with COVID chat, but I am <laughs> interested in that time period because you train, you, you spend your whole life training for these regattas, mm. but the journey, if it was already described, is more important. But when you know that the schedule has been wiped for essentially a year or longer and you've got nothing to train towards, how much does that mess with your mind and what did you do across that period? Yeah, I think what, what I guess we don't, race that often anyway like we may only have five regattas a year um so I guess what the hardest thing I found was that I felt like I was so prepared I was just ready to go for the Olympics that year um so I think uh they got cancelled or sorry postponed in March and we the Olympics were supposed to be in August and so for me I was like man what if someone else gets better in this year the next year and so that was probably one of the scariest things. I was like, man, I want to do it now because I, I know I'm good. I'm good to go. And so it took me a little while to kind of get my head around and figure out or a couple of weeks because we also went into that lockdown in that period where we couldn't, you know, see anyone. We couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't, I couldn't get on the lake. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it took me, a, you know, a few goes to be like, okay, so what is making me really unsettled? And that was it. I was like, man, I'm afraid – I was going so hard into this Olympics. What if someone else comes along in the next year? Which is kind of really opposite to what I thought. You know, that's not how I function every day. But that's what came to my mind. So for me, it's like, wow, okay. I guess working through it, getting, acknowledging, being honest about it was really important. Acknowledging it and then go, okay, next steps. What are we doing? Okay, well, how can we make the most of this situation? I can't go paddling. But I've, you know, we raided the gym the, the night before where we could. I uh, got a, 
got a kayak erg and all these things. I've got a, um, a bike, you know. So, I mean, Gordy's, uh, he's an amazing coach and planner. So the training didn't stop. It stayed the same. Just one thing was missing was the water. Yeah. Was that a big thing to miss? Is yeah, how, how important absolutely. is the water to you as a person? Massive. Like, <laughs> I think we talk about, you know, I what we find sometimes athletes will – just say you're a paddler and I go, you know what, I'm going to go running because I want to be really fit. It's like, well, you don't go to the Olympics for running. Uh, you know, you, you can go to the gym and you work really hard in the gym, but, you know, really you paddle. That's what we do. So, and it's a lot in skill, technique, uh, feel. And it's like you're not touching your craft for four weeks. You're like, oh, my gosh, what if I'm not as good when I get back to it? But what was awesome is that once we got back to it, you know, the fitness hadn't changed. It got better in some aspects because we found new ways to look at things, new ways to do things. So there was opportunities um, in that situation. Um, and also, I guess looking back now, it really, it would have, you know, I got one more year to get fitter. And for me to compete and to do that whole week of racing at the Olympics that I did, racing over those four events, I was, you know, it's going to help me. Yeah. Putting kayaking to the side just for one second, how important is water to you and your personality? Uh, yeah, I'd no, say... Not as in, like, literally, you have to drink water. You've got to drink water <laughs> in three days, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You're gone, Berger. But I mean, like, being on the water, being around the water, yeah. that side of it. It's really, you know, the water is really important to me. Um, I, you know, as kids, uh, we, we grew up at the beach. So, you know, just across the road... Um, there was the ocean. So for me, it's I guess it's an anchoring point. It's something that I love. And I guess it's what I do. Now I've just kind of doubled down and it's my my job. And I get to paddle on the most amazing lakes in the world and rivers around New Zealand and in the world. So, you know, like it's, it, it's pretty important. And, yeah, it's amazing what you get to see on the water. But Lisa, this has been an incredible chat, so thank you so much. I'm not trying to wrap us up yet, but I was just reflecting on everything you've said. There's so many transferable skills that you'll be able to use later in life or when mm. the, the paddling finishes. Have you given that much thought about what you might do once once you step out of the boat? Yeah, it's it's a really tricky one. I, it's, it's hard because I don't really want to be locked into anything. You know, I'm not, I don't have a profession, like I'm not going to be an accountant or a lawyer, you know, nothing like that. I don't have that set up as such. But I think, you know, when I left school um, at, you know, 18, it was, you know, if this athlete thing doesn't go well, at least I'll have a university degree. So since that, since I left school, um, I've just been studying and just kind of something that I've been really passionate about is psychology. So over that time, I've, you know, got a, Degree, a Bachelor of Arts and, you know, picked up some psychology, graduate diplomas and that type of thing. So, yeah, I don't really know, but it's definitely like, it's funny, like just building, like everything I learn, you know, there may not be a specific job title, but I think it's got to be, like you said, hopefully transferable. I've never worked a full job before, so I don't know what it's like out there. <laughs> for, for what it's worth, I think you'd be an incredible psychologist. Yeah. Can you imagine the cues to see you know, yeah. the, the greatest ever and give some advice on how to improve? Are we starting to move away from, from paddling and kayaking? Can yeah. I, yeah, we can. Can, can I ask, can I double down on a kayak? Hey, like, man, do whatever you want. This is your show. Hurt. You spoke about hurt. like hurt, being in that kind of hurt locker, I guess, in the race. Mm. My impression is that that is magnified when you're at the Olympics, but how often are you in that same hurt just everyday training? Um, I think it's not that often, I don't think. Like there's also, um, you don't have to be struggling all the time and, and as an athlete. I think there's a lot of training. Most of our training isn't done in that, you know, that high, high intensity. Um, and also, you know, because we also are sprinting, we may go hard, but it's for a short period of time. It's when you go hard for a long period of time. So for me, there may be only, I don't know, a few sessions a week where I have to really, really go into that place where it's difficult and it hurts. And But everyone finds different things hard, right? So for me, it's just going hard for a long period of time and dying. It's going slower. <laughs> and is that hurt, that training hurt comparable to regatta hurt? Um, are, are they different feelings? Training's probably harder because um, you 
have a repeat effort. So you've got to go back and back and back. Um, and also, uh, you're tired. So you don't train, you know, your week of um, training is just building on, you know, the day before and the week before. So there's no real point where you're really fresh. So when you're when you're fresh, it's, you know, it's probably a lot easier mentally, not as tired, so you can push yourself into that place. But I guess when you're kind of doing efforts, you know, you might have, well, we did a, like, a, it's called a VO2 training session yesterday, and um, I have to convince myself that it's good for me. And what is it building? So for me, it's, I guess, is this is my process. It's like, hey, what is it building? It's building my, you know, my physiology, my VO2, which is really important for my race. So kind of making it my choice to go to that place, to perform, to not give up, um, but also not being too hard on myself um, that maybe I'm not hitting my targets, but it's, it's the trying that's important. I also embarrassed myself with Olympic gold medalist Emma Twig oh. when we started talking about gym ergs and what times we could do. <laughs> oh, why? <laughs> yeah, I asked myself that question afterwards. Um, I've never seen a kayak erg. Aside from it, I guess, propelling you forward, mm. how much does that piece of apparatus suck in a gym? Yeah, so <laughs> I probably, I only realised, I only, I guess I only started enjoying it uh, being on we don't get on them that often because we always want to get on the water. Right. Um, and so was during COVID when I couldn't get on the water, I'm like, man, me and this piece of equipment, we don't like each other. Um, so I had to go, okay. And I just been avoiding it. So I was like, oh, I don't have to. So I'll just, I'll just go on the water. Whereas, you know, the rowers, they spend a lot of time on the ergs. And I think there's probably, you know, it's a bit more in their culture to do more training on the ergs. Whereas in New Zealand, we, you know, we don't. We can always get on the water and paddle. Um, so, yeah, I hate, it's, you know, it is a love-hate relationship because we also do a lot of our testing on the ergs. So we, you know, do these efforts. So you've got, you know, the VO2 masks and uh, you block your nose and you can't breathe and you're going to a place where, you, you know, you're just dying. So I think, um, yeah, you've got to you've got to find a way to know how it's good for you as well. How's, <laughs> how's, your, how's your erg game going now these days, Shay? These days, yeah. On the nah, nah. <laughs> I've, I'm, I've dropped from where I was when I was trying to compare times with Emma, with Emma Twig. Like, there's no chance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she she yeah. reckoned I could go okay, but I think <laughs> she was just being very polite. <laughs> hey, I'm going to take us on a little detour. It's another um, Bucky story. I wasn't really sure where to put it, but we'll, we'll see how it goes, and we'll see if you remember it. <laughs> it's from the London Olympics, and he said that you'd been together about two and a half years. And he was staying with your folks out of London. Mm. And he said there was a, a <laughs> it was the penultimate day of the Olympics. And you'd got a gold medal. There was a supporters dinner that night, which was an amazing occasion. Is this ringing a bell? Maybe. Yeah. Oh. And he said that, <laughs> you know, um, there was a last train to <laughs> go back to your parents' place. And he sort of took a bit of a, a shot of the situation and thought, no, Lisa looks like she's up for partying. <laughs> I'm going to stay out. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, you know, we'll figure it out. Did you and carry then, on partying? I think that's where the story's <laughs> going. And then, <laughs> hour, and, then about an hour, and then about an hour later, you've decided, you've crashed mentally and physically. It's been a big day. It's been a lot of emotions. <laughs> and you've sort of gone back to your, your base. And he's sort of there stranded. <laughs> yeah. Do you pick up the story from yeah, here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, and I mean, he couldn't catch a train until, I don't know, the next morning. Yeah. And it's not like, because we went back to the village, it's not like he can come along and, um, you know, sleep there. So, yeah, I think, oh, man, I feel like I put him in some real tough situations. <laughs> I put myself first a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I think too, like, there was also, I don't know if he mentioned it to you, but I was given these, um, the basketball tickets for the finals. Uh, it must have been maybe the next day or whatever it was. And I was like, oh, man, Bucky, I got these tickets to the basketball. And um, I hadn't really thought about it. And they were only for athletes. And so I told him, and he was like, getting ready to go. I give him a call. And I, I was like, he's about to get on the train. I was like, oh, you can't come. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this was his version of the <laughs> yeah, story, yeah. was that after you decide to go back 
he's kind of stranded and he, <laughs> and he pairs up with some like helper or someone he didn't really know <laughs> who turned out to be a raver who <laughs> yeah. was out until like six in the morning and he was like I was sleeping at his place so I had to go with him so he's just like going from nightclub <laughs> to nightclub <laughs> yeah. and just exhausted he eventually like gets back to his place catches the first train back to your folks place and that's when he gets the message about the basketball. Yeah. And he's like, Lisa, Obvi- obviously excited as well. <laughs> exactly. the opportunity and then Lisa, the Lisa messaged me and says, um, you know, do you want to come to the basketball final? And he went from like a zero out of 10 to a 10 out of 10. Like, <laughs> yes, amazing. Oh, okay, I'm back. Gets on the train to come meet you. And then it's like, oh, actually, um, <laughs> yeah, you need accreditation. Sorry, mate. So he said, I was just deflated. They went back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. It is, I mean, it's wicked. Like he, um, we'd only been, yeah, together for a few years at that point. Um, you know, a lot of courage to stay with my parents yeah, <laughs> at that yeah. point too. Um, yeah, but it was, I mean, it was pretty cool. I remember those Olympics and, you know, being the first time, uh, my parents were there, my brothers, um, Bucky, and then a whole bunch of, you know, friends and family. And it was, it was crazy. Like, I, I guess the London Olympics, you know, people told me, you know, was particularly we had to sit down with um, Hamish Carter and he's like, you know, you've, you've got to go there and um, you don't want to completely ignore the situation. You know, what you want to enjoy the Olympics, but don't let it distract you from, you know, what you're there to do, which is awesome advice. Um, and so we were there, it was awesome, and it seemed really easy, you know, like it was in an English-speaking country, a lot easier to, you know, we, we do a lot of our racing in Europe and places like Hungary and Germany, Poland, so we don't, our cultures and our languages are quite different, so... To be there, it's like, man, this is easy. I loved it. had a great experience. And then, you know, four years later, we go to Brazil uh, for our next Olympics. You know, the, um, you know, the village is barely built. Um, our course is a lagoon, which is, you know, we usually have fresh water. It's salt water. There's leaves and rubbish in the water. It's polluted. Um, and there's a huge rate of crime. So, you know, I went from these uh, Olympics, which were like a dream. It's like, man, the Olympics is they're so easy to then going to a completely different place so I guess what's amazing about the Olympics is it's like wow they're all really different every country does it differently but you still have to figure out how to perform in those moments whether it's easy or not easy but you know the challenges will be different the the other area I've been asked to explore is <laughs> your level of fame and it suggested that sort of like walking around in Auckland or down the street, you're <laughs> relatively unbothered. But some of these like European regattas or when you're overseas, it's like you're mobbed. You're like, it's just, it's just all noise. Is that, is that right? Yeah, it's, it's kind it's quite weird. I think <laughs> like I'll be, I don't know, places, you know, kayaking's not big in New Zealand, but you go to places like Spain, Hungary, Germany it's it's kind of big and so I remember being in Italy and having to be on a push bike these like foldable bikes and just pedaling down the side because there's this mob of like a genuine mob yeah people <laughs> chasing me <laughs> and I'm like oh my god Lisa <laughs> yeah. and I'm like because like, once you stop you know then you're stuck you've got to do photos whatever and I was just trying to get oh, we had my next race coming up and yeah similar to Hungary and I think there's a one girl, she is a bit of a fan, so she figured out this was in Hungary, and so she figured out that you know Bucky was my or oh, at the time just my my boyfriend. There was my family there, so she managed to just sit herself around my family, just hoping oh, <laughs> that I would turn up wow. and <laughs> see my family. Awesome. And she, I didn't show up, and so when I did finally, she had a little gift for me, and yeah. Wow. It, how I don't know if it's fame, it's just that, you know, from New Zealand, so far away. So these people go to these world championships being like, okay, this is my one chance I can meet this person that I, you know, I guess it's like any sport. There's a lot of overseas souvenir collectors as well. Like, are they yes. come in with photos for you to sign? Yes. And so, yeah, man, it's crazy. Like, the, the Germans, Polish, the Czechs, like, they somehow get themselves into uh, – I don't know, they have accreditation, so they'd be standing by your boat bag or your boat area and holding their photos, which was really strange. There was a guy here um, at the Halbergs, and he had these photos of me, and he's like, uh, do, do you think you could sign? I'm like... Good accent. Really good accent. Yeah, no, no, really sorry, I tried. No, 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 it's a good one. Lean into the accent. It's a long <laughs> 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 Stephen's um, accent's a terrible. Just, that was great. <laughs> I just cracked. I'm like, are you German? He's like, yes. 
<laughs> it's crazy. They're everywhere. How, how, do you, how does fame sit with you in general? Because my perception again is that you're quite a private person. Mm, um, yeah. But there is a le- there is a level of recognition that comes with your success. Yeah, it's not. I guess I'm. Yeah, I'm incredibly private. Um, I am in a way shy. Um, so yeah, it's not something that I asked for. It's not something that I believed when I was growing up, you know, I'm going to be someone that people know, you know, it, so yeah, it's, it's okay. But I guess, you know, I, I also don't expect people to know who I am. So I think that level of just being, having that level of humility that I am the same as everyone else. I may have achieved these, these things. I might be on the radio or on TV, you might see my face, but you know, but if people recognize me, they come up for a photo, you know, that's something that I am too shy to do is go up to someone that, you know, I admire and ask for a photo. That's scary. So I guess, you know what, that's, yeah, that's all good. <laughs> hey, um, just the last bit from me and then we'll sort of start wrapping up. Um, the Dame stuff, getting yeah, that. Shit, we didn't even go. Did you say Dame Lisa Carrington in the intro? No. Fuck. Ooh, the king, <laughs> we're having, the yeah. king is going to be after you, my yeah, friend. Yeah, 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 yeah. Holy hecka. Oh, well, maybe you can put a little uh, edit in. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> Welcome to Between Sound the really Bears. good. Um, how was that whole process? Like, when did you become aware that you were getting a, a dame hood? Da- yeah. What's yep, dame hood. Dame hood? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, and how does that, yeah, what does yeah, that I, sit with you? Yeah, I think it's, I guess it, it's a huge like I guess I feel so. Um, I guess you just feel really special that people want to acknowledge um, what I've done, and I guess I know, you know, that the work that I put in, and I guess we've touched on a bit. You know, for me, it's I put a lot in. It's my life and the performances that I've managed to do. You know, it takes a lot. So for people other than myself or my family and friends to to see that is it is really special and I think you know I remember getting a you know uh Jacinda Ardern she uh sent me a letter and it was something like these you know it's not just about you you know this this acknowledgement it's also about your your family uh what you know their contributions as well and I was like man yeah even though I get the name or the title it's really you know it is about it is about them and that you know, the support and the influence and whatever they've done, it's also, you know, you can't do it on your own. So that was a really nice way for me to remind myself, you know, as much as I've, I say, I've, you know, I crossed the finish line, I got the gold medals, but really, like, I can't do it without any of those people. It's a great way of thinking of things. I can't imagine how proud your parents mm. were when you were getting... Yeah. Well, I wouldn't know, right, until you have your own, I think. And, you know, I get really embarrassed by my parents, like, if... I go, don't, don't be too proud. Like, shh. <laughs> <laughs> Along the same lines, when someone said to you in 2012 that you were the first Māori athlete to win yeah. a gold medal for New Zealand, looking back at that now and thinking about those that you inspire or those that have come along on the journey with you, has your perception or your perspective on that changed? Yeah, I, what's, uh, it, was, uh, it shocked me, to be honest, at that moment. And I thought, why, has, have, why am I the only Māori at this point to have won a gold medal and I guess you know that I, I since then though we've had some amazing success from other Maori men and women um yeah so I guess what I'm yeah you know a lot of the athletes that you know I've been able to come across and especially um you know the sevens woman and being able to I remember finishing those uh the London Olympics and then you know that the sevens came into the Olympics in 2016 so was really wicked to be able to talk to them before starting their four-year campaign to head into that and think you know then I don't know a few years later that they you know they got a silver and a gold so I guess what's really nice is the relationships are still really genuine and important because we we know what it takes or you you know your fellow soldiers or whatever it is you know like that's really nice to have those relationships with people you may not see them every day they're not your best mates but I don't know you share that yeah, women's sport in New Zealand is, seems like it's in a really good place and you're one of the people that has helped 
everyone on this journey. So I'm going to start wrapping us up, Shay. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit. Shay's our outro guy. There's a lot of pressure. A lot of I people. Did see, I did see that go. <gasps> yeah, a lot of people have been but reacting I get, strongly to the outro, I, so there's ah, a bit of pressure. Yeah, to come I've had here. 119 opportunities to do an outro, <laughs> and I get another opportunity today to do one. <laughs> but I'll just say from my perspective first, thank you so much for coming and sharing. Um, we often talk about the, the incredible opportunities we get to talk to world beaters mm -hmm. um, but there's none better than you and so mm -hmm. your experiences and especially the stuff about self-doubt and how you get through it and the discipline and uh, commitment and consistency of your training I think are amazing there's a really powerful passage in the middle there that I'm still thinking about but yeah thank you so much this has been such a great chat ever I'm going to throw to the outro master <sighs> and I, uh, okay all right <laughs> um, I think like the the ability to inspire others while you're leading your field is an, is an amazing thing. Um, but the thing that's resonated with me the most is um, your gratitude, your gratitude for what you've achieved, but your gratitude for the, the I guess, the day-to-day -day opportunities for you to practice your craft or do the things that bring you joy. Like gratitude is a, is a really interesting concept to me because I try and practice it, but I don't always get it right. And there was something you said earlier, which was small bits all the time. And that's something that I'll take away as well as just kind of reflecting on where you are right now and what you're thankful for. And the fact that you can do that for something as mundane as another, I say mundane, I mean it respectfully, <laughs> but as another training session versus the opportunity to create a moment of, of magical history, not only for yourself, but for your family, for your whanau, for the country, um, is just incredible. And like most Kiwis that we've had in here, if not all Kiwis that we've had in here, you're just so relatable and so normal and you could have mm -hmm. just been a student that I grew up with at my high school that turned into a world beater and I think that's amazing um, testament to your humility and to your character um, I really look forward to seeing you in action again <laughs> but more importantly to see what you can contribute to society um, after you finally put the paddles down um, and you get the opportunity to share this with everyday people um, I think that's really really awesome so thank you very much for sharing time with us Cool, thank you. It's been really cool. I think, you know, the, I don't always sit down, obviously, and talk like this, so it's been really cool. I really loved um, sharing and reminding myself of the things that, um, you know, that I hold, that rem that help me be myself every day. So it's, you know, you never stop learning or reminding or what it takes. So, yeah, thank you. Maybe we can claim a little bit of credit for that <laughs> next gold medal then, Shay. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, Lisa Carrington, thank you so much. Dame Lisa Carrington. Dame Lisa Carrington, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> thank you.